Welcome to the Legally Speaking Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Hanna. I'm pleased to introduce to you our ClioCon 2023 mini clips, mini series. I am delighted to be joined by Erica Harold. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure and to meet you in person and to do this at ClioCon. But would you mind telling our listeners a little bit more about you and your background? I'd be delighted. I am currently the executive director of the Illinois Supreme Court Commission on Professionalism. And what that means in a nutshell is we are a commission that was founded by the Illinois Supreme Court to promote civility, ethics, professionalism, and diversity and inclusion among Illinois lawyers and judges. I've been in my position since last year, and I'm really enjoying it. Prior to being appointed to this position, I was a litigator focusing on fiduciary litigation. Wow. So why did you want to go into law in the first place? I wanted to be an advocate for justice. I decided I wanted to be a lawyer when I was in high school because of an experience I had when I was the victim of bullying and harassment and didn't feel that I really had a voice. And as a result, I wanted to be able to gain the skills not only to be able to advocate for myself, but be able to advocate for other people who needed a voice. I like that. And this is the big thing about obviously what Clio are about with access to justice and merging technology with that. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But in terms of sort of your day to day, what does that look like? The commission has an incredible myriad of programs. We have a very active blog and social media channel. So I would encourage people to go to twocivility.org where we have blogs on everything from legal tech to ethics, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We deal with law students as well. So there, anyone who's listening would find blogs that would be able to in, engage them. We also put on a great conference every year that highlights some of the visionaries. It's called Future Is Now. And it highlights some of the visionaries and leaders in the law and looking at where the profession is and where the profession needs to go. We do a lot of educational programs for judges and lawyers, but our goal is really to think about our profession, our justice system, and to get lawyers and judges to think about their roles within the rules of professional conduct and how they can make an impact on and using professionalism to do that. Yeah, I want to go back to a word that you mentioned before, because it's, it's something I'm passionate about, is you mentioned bullying, right? And I think, why do you think it's so significant to address the impact of bullying in the legal profession, not just in person, but also online? It's a huge issue that we're focused on right now at the commission. We right now have launched an initiative focused on bullying in the legal profession. And as we're talking to you right now, we have a survey out to all active lawyers in Illinois It's one of the, it's believed to be one of the first of its kind in the nation that's assessing the prevalence of bullying, what people's experience, the impact, and more importantly, what we can do to address it. And as you mentioned, with the advent of technology, you see a lot of people being able to use some of these social media technologies and platforms that could be used for good, that could be used to bridge the access to justice, but instead are using them in ways to target other people. So our survey is going to look at are people finding themselves experiencing bullying on Zoom platforms that are becoming more prevalent? I think one of the big issues is that face-to-face, people find it a little bit more challenging to say mean-spirited things to people. But you get keyboard warriors and people who have kind of the impersonal nature of technology, and it creates a barrier that kind of dehumanizes people and takes away the empathy. Yeah, no, and I I love the work that you're doing. It's not just the words, it's the action. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in as to Miss America 2003, you developed a national initiative to prevent bullying in schools, collaborating with the National Center for Victims of Crime and the U.S. Certain General. You even won an award for your advocacy, I believe. So would you mind sharing what the national initiative was about in more detail? At the time when I was crowned Miss America, I recognized that people viewed that as a title that was sort of fluffy and people thought, what could you actually do with that? But what I found is it gave me this incredible national platform to be able to talk not only to kids throughout the country, but also to talk to lawmakers. And I knew that when people thought about Miss America, they were not thinking about somebody who herself had been bullied. So I thought it was a way to take the power of that crown and the stereotypes and to juxtapose it with my own experience to draw attention to the issue and to try to advocate for change. And at the time when I was promoting this, people did not take bullying in schools very seriously. So what we did was we did a public service campaign where we were talking about the real impacts on student performance, links to self-harm, and 
trying to get people to understand this is not just sticks and stones may break my bones. We're talking about student success. We promoted model policies for schools to adopt in their schools to be able to protect students. And when you think about where we are now, about 20 plus years later, I won't say exactly, because I don't want to age myself too much, but it's unconscionable and unthinkable for people to think that students would be subjected to bullying and that it would be okay. And what we're hoping to do at the commission is to have that kind of cultural change. Right now, people think in, about law firms and the legal profession. You think about screaming and bullying as sort of endemic to our profession. 10 years from now, I want us to be having a very different conversation where identifying people who are screamers and the bullies and the jerks, that that would be unthinkable within our profession. Yeah, and I'm all for that. And that's some of the values that we really absolutely support. And I know Clio support as, as well. And we're going to talk about ClioCon just after this, because I want to talk about your, your time at studying at Harvard Law, which leads nicely onto what you were just saying, because you served on the teaching faculty of the law school's trial advocacy workshop. And you taught students about the U.S. legal system as part of the lawyers, I believe, in the classroom program, right? And so do you emphasize any skills specifically that you think are important for success in the legal field today and moving forward? We talk about being able to be a vigorous advocate for clients, especially at Harvard Law School. I go back every year and for about a week and I'm part of their trial advocacy workshop. We talk to students about being vigorous advocates for your clients and vigorous advocates for their rights but doing so in a way that's still grounded in professionalism and civility. Too often people think that civility just means being nice, being kind, being weak. What it really means is summoning up the best of your professional training and being able to present your case in a way that's winsome and persuasive while still respecting the dignity of other people. In the classroom, we do a lot at the commission going into law schools, talking to them about rooting their careers in professionalism. If we're going to think about creating a more ethical profession, about how to use some of these legal technologies in ways that are ethical and moral and actually increase access to justice, we have to get students thinking early about what does it mean to be an ethical lawyer, a professional lawyer. It's not just fighting for your client in ways that may denigrate other people. It's using the best of your training to be able to harness the best technologies we have to be able to serve justice. And that leads nicely on to what I was going to say and, and why perhaps you're, you're here today. We're at ClioCon, arguably the largest and best legal conference in, in the world. I'm, I'm loving the experience. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's incredible. But, you know, access to justice we've talked about. Um, you know, I don't know if you saw Jack Newton's keynote speech, but that was a large part of what he was talking about. How have you embraced technology and, and particularly like what are you impressed about Clio and how, how can that help people generally in terms of the technology they're bringing out? At the commission, we, t we focus on legal technology as it relates to the rules of professional conduct and the ethical prism that lawyers have to apply when they're deciding whether to embrace these technologies. We very much support innovation and we want to encourage all of the lawyers and judges with whom we engage to be able to think about how they can use these technologies to actually build better connections with their clients, improve their delivery of legal services, but to do it in a way that respects the confidentiality that you have to preserve, that still makes sure that when you sign your name on a on a pleading, you have done your site checking so that you are not you are not making headlines by submitting a case that does not exist to a court. But I think the thing that we I've most enjoyed at Clio, if this this is my favorite time and my first time being here, is that it is sparking creativity within the rules that exist, but encouraging us to push the boundaries for what's possible for access to justice. We just heard Brian Banks who gave a wonderful speech about the justice system. He was wrongfully convicted and he encouraged everyone in the room, whether you're involved in criminal justice reform or not, but to think about how you can leverage technology and more importantly, to think about how you can use that to create a justice system that aligns with our highest principles and constitutional values. Yeah, it's so important. And that's one of the things, isn't it? The, the, the keynote speech is I'm taking something from all of them. They've just been phenomenal. We've, we've had so many amazing voices. If you were to sort of look forward to ClioCon, Texas, Austin next year, why would you say to people to, to come along? Maybe you're just not as interested in technology. Obviously, this is all about technology. But as the overall experience, why should people in and around the legal industry really start thinking about ClioCon, Texas, Austin? I think that when you think about technology as it relates to the profession, some people are just thinking in very product specific ways. 
but Clio and Khan really encourages people to think in innovative and justice specific ways. And there's no area of legal practice right now that is not touched by technology. If you're a litigator, you're going to be oftentimes appearing in court by Zoom. You're going to be doing depositions by Zoom. If you're a law professor, you're going to be engaging students sometimes by Zoom. You're going to be teaching them how to leverage AI, generative AI. You're going to be developing policies. If you are someone who is thinking technology is not really part of my life, if, how, do you, how are clients going to find out who you are and what specifically you have to offer them? And when they say, I don't have time to come into your office, can't you just meet me by Zoom? What are you going to do? I want, well, I think at the commission, we want all lawyers to be able to be equipped to embrace this innovation. And ClioCon's a great way for them to do that and tap into that energy. Yeah, and, and it is the great word, energy. It's got a good electric feel to it. But I want to, before we sort of conclude, because I know it's something I'm passionate about, you're passionate about, and I'm a legal community builder, but as a strong advocate for more civil and an inclusive legal profession, which we've touched on, why have you chosen to focus on these values and what impact have you seen in the legal community as a result? What are some of the success stories? The Illinois Supreme Court has to get so much credit for founding this commission and deciding that it's something that should exist to be able to highlight in an aspira aspirational way these values. What I have seen some of these success stories, first of all, we know from our surveys at the commission that lawyers recognize incivility makes the profession more challenging. It increased costs, costs for clients. It decreases diversity. And so you can see quantifiable ways in which incivility harms our ability to serve clients and to more importantly, deliver justice. Incivility also undermines people's confidence in the legal system. And at a time when we're looking about rebuilding trust in institutions and thinking about the role of lawyers in not just the justice system, but our democracy as a whole, civility and how we conduct ourselves has to be at the forefront of how we're engaging. It's not just enough to go into court and win, but you rep you recognize you're an officer of the courts and you rec you're a leader in your community and people look to you to embody certain elements of justice. So now more than ever, we need lawyers who are rooted in civility, rooted in professionalism, and are embracing the mandate to deliver justice and to really restore the public's confidence in what we do. I love that. And finally, given that your career has been diverse, what advice would you give for those interested in a diverse career like yours that spans from law to advocacy, even to beauty passion? So uh, to help, to tell people what will be your one piece of advice. My one piece of advice is to be willing to take risks. I entered the Miss America pageant because I'd been accepted to Harvard Law School and didn't have a way of paying for it. And it was going to be cost prohibitive but I decided that I was going to try to be able to earn the scholarship money through that pageant to be able to fund my legal career. It was certainly a risk because I did not grow up doing pageants, but it opened up so many opportunities. It opened up an opportunity to go to Harvard Law School and graduate debt-free, to be able to have a national platform, and then to be able to think about how do I open the door to other people. Uh, I've been involved in criminal justice reform and prison ministry for about 15 years, and I've tried to think about where my opportunities and risk taking might give me the opportunity to take risks on behalf of others. So my final piece of advice is when you're taking risk, don't just think of it about advancing your own career. Think about who doesn't have a voice and who doesn't have an advocate and needs you to use your platform and take a risk on their behalf. Love it. And I'm all about risk. So uh, I love that you finished on that. And if our listeners want to find out more about your career or the Illinois Supreme Court Commission on Professionalism. Where can they find out more? Feel free to share any social media handles, websites. They should go to twocivility.org and it's the number two, civility.org. You can find all of our social media channels. We're very active on Twitter, on Facebook, on LinkedIn. And if you could follow me as well, because we are doing innovative things. And if people have ideas of how we can improve and innovate the profession, we'd love to hear from them. Love it. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Erica. I've had an absolute bar blast. And from now, from all of us on the Legally Speaking Podcast, over and out.